This is a, a very special service uh, in a lot of ways, uh, not the least of which is our sermon text is the longest text that any pastor, as far as we know, in the 159-year history of the Neroten Presbyterian Church has ever attempted to preach. 69 verses. So you're going to be part of something very historic this morning. And, and I do hope that all of you received the email that we sent out about this being a two-hour service <laughs> rather than our regular. <laughs> I'm glad you laughed because they didn't think that was funny at 9 a.m. So <laughs> who's picking these preaching texts anyway, Brandy? <laughs> all right, so we're preaching through the book of Acts in 2022, and we've entitled our series, The Acts of God, Lessons from the Early Church. We're now about three quarters of the way through this magnificent book, and this morning I'm going to attempt to tackle all of chapter 21 and most of chapter 22 in 25 minutes or less. So here's the game plan. Uh, it's a little unusual. I'm going to summarize most of the story, and then uh, I'll, I will read parts of it here and there, and then I'll offer us one takeaway at the end, okay? So let's say a prayer, and then away we go. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word and for all the lessons we've learned in this incredible book that you revealed to us to reveal your plan for us and to teach us a little bit about your love and how you're calling us to follow after you. And so we pray, give us open hearts this morning. Make our minds and spirits wide awake so that we can hear you by the power of your spirit speaking through the medium of your word. Do it again for your name's sake and the sake of your kingdom, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so the story of the early church continues after quite an emotional, tearful goodbye with the followers of Jesus in the city of Ephesus. The apostle Paul boards a ship with an itinerary that will take him in modern terms from western Turkey over to the coast of Israel. He is determined to go to Jerusalem because he wants to deliver an offering that he has collected from a bunch of Gentile churches to support the poor Christians in Jerusalem who have suffered both from what's called the Great Famine but also from persecution. And there is also good reason to believe that this was an important act of solidarity for Paul, an attempt to ease the tensions, if you will, between the Gentile churches and the Jewish church in Jerusalem. The Jewish Christians still struggled to fully accept and understand Paul's ministry to the Gentiles. And finally, Paul believed with all of his heart that giving and caring for the poor and the needy was a very natural expression of any genuine faith in Jesus. Okay, so there were several brief stops at ports of call on his sea route to Jerusalem, and each time they anchored, he found the disciples in those coastal towns, and he stayed with them. And each time, they had a clear message for Paul, do not go to Jerusalem. In fact, the scriptures even seem to indicate to us that these warnings to him were inspired by the Holy Spirit. In fact, on one occasion, the message was illustrated quite graphically for him 
by a rather well-respected prophet. Let me read to you a few verses from chapter 21, verses 10 to 14. This is what it says. It says, he went right up to Paul, and he took Paul's belt and tied himself up, hands and feet. And then he said, this is what the Holy Spirit says. The Jews in Jerusalem are going to tie up the man who owns this belt, just like this, and hand him over to the godless unbelievers. Well, when we heard this, this is Luke and the other disciples, we and the people there, we pleaded with Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. And then Paul answered, why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I'm ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And when he would not be dissuaded, says we gave up and said then the Lord's will be done. I think Paul responded this way to them because, quite frankly, this is nothing new for him. Let me read to you what he said to the brothers and sisters in Ephesus before he boarded the ship. This is what he said. This is chapter 20, verses 22 and 23. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships await me. Someone described this as the first century version of Mission Impossible. You know the famous line, Paul was told, this is your mission if you choose to accept it. Well, despite all the dangers and the warnings, he chose to accept it for the sake of the gospel. And so he bravely continues his journey to Jerusalem. And as an aside, which really is not an aside, but actually the main point of the book, Paul remains keenly aware throughout all of this that God is with him. So let's not lose sight of that really, really, really important point. The whole book of Acts, if you recall, began with the arrival of the Holy Spirit to empower and accompany the disciples on this very mission. And in Paul's writings, he will later make it abundantly clear that he knew the whole time that he was in Christ and Christ was in him. And I think without that important detail, at least in my opinion, none of this book makes any sense at all. Okay, let's keep rolling, shall we? When he finally arrives in the holy city, he's welcomed with open arms of love by the Jewish followers of Jesus. And after a night of rest, his first meeting the next day is with the leader of the Jerusalem church, James, the brother of Jesus. Now, I imagine Paul must have been so excited to deliver the collection from his charity drive for the church in Jerusalem. In fact, in my mind, I'll tell you what I imagine. I imagine they must have been utterly blown away by this gift and the generosity of their Gentile brothers and sisters. I imagine lots of tears flowing here. Luke records for us that all the elders were present too And they were very eager to hear a report from Paul about God's exploits through the disciples serving in the Greek-speaking, Gentile-dominated world where Paul has been ministering in Greece and Asia Minor. I also picture their jaws hitting the floor as Paul filled them in on detail after spellbinding detail of God's wonder-working power and how so many Gentiles responded 
to the gospel by placing their faith in Jesus. It does say that when they heard all of this, they praised God. And I love that they were equally pleased to tell Paul that lots of Jews have also come to believe in Jesus as the Messiah of Israel, and they're faithfully serving God and keeping his commandments. However, despite this, all this wonderful kumbaya stuff, they do still have a niggling issue to discuss with Paul. They continue to hear troubling rumors that he's still teaching the Jews who live among the Gentiles to just disregard some of the teachings of Moses, including circumcision. And they say to him, look, this is a big problem for us because some of our own zealous Jewish Christians, along with all of our Jewish friends and neighbors, they think you're undermining God's clear instruction for us. So what do you suggest we do since they all know that you're now here? How, how are we to disabuse them of this notion? So they decide to hatch a plan to rehabilitate Paul's reputation. They tell him to join four other guys all involved in a purification ritual. And hopefully this will convince Everyone that you're still committed to keeping the commands of God. And so Paul did as he was told. And then in the name of no good deed ever goes unpunished. (laughs) At the end of the seven days of the ritual purification, he's up on the temple mount among the crowds that had gathered for the feast of Pentecost when some Jewish pilgrims from Ephesus recognize him, and they immediately grab him, and they begin announcing to the crowds, hey, this is the guy who's the enemy of our people. He's the one who keeps teaching against us, and against our law, and against this very place, the temple, and now he's even trying to bring some unclean guy, some Greek guy into the temple to defile it. A word quack quickly spread throughout the whole city and so it says that people literally started running from all over Jerusalem to get in on the action and they dragged Paul down the stone stairs of the temple courts and then locked the gates behind them and then this violent frenzied mob decided to take justice into their own hands, and they began to execute Paul as they rained down blow after blow after blow upon him. And somehow, in the midst of this melee, a Roman commander received word that a riot was going down at the Temple Mount. And so he scrambled his troop of Roman soldiers with orders to go and break up the mob. And they arrived just in time. Paul must have been bloodied and bruised and just barely conscious. The commander immediately placed Paul under arrest and clapped his wrists in double-chained irons with orders to deliver him to the military barracks for both interrogation and safety. Well, this move just simply had the effect of infuriating the crowd who were so determined to rid the earth of this defiler of Israel. So when the officers started to escort him down the steps of the temple, the crowd was so enraged and determined to murder Paul that the soldiers that said they actually had to pick him up and carry him out as the people were shouting, kill him, kill him. I wonder if at some point Paul was thinking to himself, maybe I should have listened to my friends, right? 
but I doubt it. I'll tell you why. Because let me read to you the last part of what he wrote to his friends in Ephesus before he departed. I read you the first part. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. Here's the next bit. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Paul knew this was coming, and he still went to Jerusalem. Like Jesus, who you remember, it says, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, knowing what was coming for him as well. Well, when they arrive at the barracks, Paul says to the Roman commander, hey, can I say something to you? And the commander is stunned and says to Paul, wait a minute, you speak Greek? I thought you were that Egyptian guy who started a revolt and led those terrorists out into the wilderness. And Paul answered, no, I'm a Jew from Tarsus and Cilicia, a citizen of no ordinary city. And then Paul says to him, get ready for it. He says to him, hey, I'd like to say something to all these nice people. And the commander is like, really? Okay, go for it. He says, Paul stands up on the steps of the barracks and he holds his arms up and with his head, I imagine, throbbing and his body aching and the good possibility that blood is flowing from his lips, the crowd goes silent. And he begins to speak to them in their own language, either Aramaic or Hebrew. So what a dramatic moment in the scriptures What can he possibly think of to say in a moment that's so intense and terrifying and violent? This is what he says to them. And I'm going to read verses 3 to 8 in chapter 22. Paul says to them, I am a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city. I studied under Gamaliel and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. I persecuted the followers of the way to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison as the high priest and all the council can themselves testify. I even obtained letters from them to their associates in Damascus, and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. About noon, as I came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting, he replied. This is the word of the Lord. So in the face of the fiercest resistance and the gravest danger imaginable, Paul tells his story of his life-changing encounter with Jesus Christ. Paul is utterly and completely consumed with the gospel. He knew that Jesus was alive. He saw him. And he's been transformed by him. And he realized that through Jesus' death and resurrection, sin and death had been conquered and hope as a result had been given to the whole world. Candidly this morning, I find this scene both convicting and inspiring. It's a bit of a rebuke to all my flimsy excuses why I don't share my own life-changing story of the way in which Jesus has transformed me. Well, people might make fun of me or ridicule me. Maybe they'll think less of me or reject me. Imagine if I said that to Paul. (laughs) Maybe he would say to me what he said to the Ephesians. He might say, I consider my life worth nothing to me. 
My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord has given me and given to you too, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. And I hope you do too, Greg. So this whole scene ends when the commander sends Paul back to the barracks to be interrogated and flogged by a centurion. And just as they're about to start the beating, Paul says to him, hey, by the way, I'm just curious, is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't even been found guilty? (laughs) And the centurion responds by running to his commander and saying to him, it appears that we missed one small but very important detail about this guy. He's actually a Roman citizen, at which point I imagine all the blood drains from the face of his commander, and he's like, oh, shoot, right? Because they could have been executed for flogging Paul. So they let him go the next day and sent him to the Sanhedrin, the Jewish Supreme Court, for questioning. Okay, we made it. 69 verses. Good work, gang. Here are my quick takeaways to conclude. The lessons for me from the early church this morning are pretty simple ones. Tell your story and care for the poor. That appears to be the whole deal. Tell your story, care for the poor. Just tell your story. You don't have to defend the faith or explain the Bible to people. Just tell people when the opportunity presents itself, not being obnoxious or shoving it down their throat, just tell them what Jesus has done for you. That's all Paul did. Here's what happened to me. I was blind, but now I see. I was lost, and now I'm found. Let's keep it simple. And finally, we've been given a hope, hope of a life where we are loved unconditionally, hope of a, of a life where we can live free from guilt and shame, hope of a life where we can be healed from our addictions, hope of a life where we are never, ever alone, and hope of a life that lasts forever. Hey, this is the hope that everyone is looking for. No wonder Paul was consumed. May we be too. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Let's pray. So, Lord, yes, by your Spirit, consume us too and give us the courage and the boldness to tell our story of how you loved us, transformed us, healed us, gave us a hope and a future. May we be faithful and courageous like Paul. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.